Today we're talking about the filibuster, one of those problems that has just been lurking on the fourth page of every major news outlet for months. Special thanks to YouTube commenter General Nas for bringing this issue to my attention. A filibuster is when Congress decides to stop metaphorically wasting everyone's time and start literally doing it. It's brought us some great moments like Ted Cruz literally reading the entire green eggs and ham at the podium. Hey, beats reading legislation. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them. Sam I am. It turns out Ted Cruz wouldn't want the Affordable Care Act in a box or with a fox. Now the irony didn't stick when at the end of the story the protagonist finally gives the eggs a chance and realizes they really like them. But that's a political point that would have been a lot more poignant in an episode released oh, 6 years ago. Boy do I feel old. So the filibuster is the embodiment of congress wasting everybody's time. Unless you want to hear Dr. Seuss weigh on on the Affordable Care Act. He is a doctor after all. Now there is a new push to get rid of the filibuster, accompanied by an equal and opposite push to not get rid of the filibuster. Today I want to explore the arguments on both sides and really figure out what's going on here. So let's start with what the filibuster actually is. Now first, and this might surprise you, but filibustering is not just a republican thing. Now I know it feels like mostly liberals grumbling about it, but democratic filibusters have impeded republican legislating, ensuring that even before democrats took the house in 2018 midterms, the GOP could not pass legislation to build a wall or cut legal immigration. What the filibuster does is enable the minority party in the senate to block or delay legislation from being voted on by the majority in the senate. To get a little deeper, I'm going to try to connect to two ideas I've introduced so far in this episode. First, the goal of the filibuster, the minority party trying to block legislation. And second, the core mechanic of the filibuster, speeches so long and slow they could have been directed by Ken Burns. The connection may seem incredibly obvious, but it leads me to two questions. First, what are you waiting for? It's not like after being subjected to Ted Cruz after a few hours, senators are going to suddenly say, you know what, civil rights, not worth it. Now, this also feeds into my second question. If Democrats were filibustering the wall legislation and cuts to legal immigration, why didn't I see videos of them reading If You Give a Mouse a Cookie? Oh, there's some key mechanics I haven't mentioned yet that lead to reports like, after Democrats blocked a vote on Neil Gorsuch, Senate Republicans going nuclear, changing the number of votes needed to confirm a Supreme Court nominee from 60 to 51. Just a simple majority. That might not sound filibuster related, but oh man was it. Remember that 60 vote number being dropped to 51 for Supreme Court nominations, because it's going to come back in about 2 minutes. The key quirk of the senate is that there's no limit on how long you can debate something, so you can literally take forever debating something. This is the goal of a filibuster because as long as something is being debated, it can't be voted on. Now, This used to be a strategy that could be employed in both halls of congress. In the early years of congress, representatives as well as senators could filibuster. As the house of representatives grew in number, however, Revisions to House rules limited debate, and that move abruptly killed the ability for people to filibuster in the House of Representatives in the early year of 1888. Such reforms haven't happened to the same extent in the Senate. Currently in the Senate there are two types of filibusters. First there are the famous ones where you have one man standing on stage for 24 hours and 18 minutes. A record set by South Carolina Senator Strom Thurmond trying to delay passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1957, boy did that turn into an unfun fact pretty quickly. If it makes you feel any better though, the racist did have to pee in a bucket several times in order to stay standing in the senate building. 
These filibusters are not that common and are held by individual senators with less popular opinions. They get off the stage and then the vote is triggered. Let's take Ted Cruz's filibuster from the beginning as an example. After 21 hours and 19 minutes standing on his feet, Ted Cruz finally sat down. Most Republicans oppose Cruz's mission, trying to defund Obamacare on a must-pass spending bill. In the end, he joined all senators in voting for a procedural measure he seemed to argue against. Well, that was a waste of time. Now these speeches are long and weird. Mike Lee, I am your father. Yeah, emphasis on weird. If those speeches were the biggest problem though, the Senate would be A-OK -okay, and nobody would be having a problem with this issue. The bigger issue is the second, virtual filibusters, although believe me, they're very real. These are the filibusters that cause most of the slowdowns in the Senate. For whatever reason, it takes 60 votes to transition something from debate to vote in the Senate. Which is odd considering it only takes 51 votes to pass that piece of legislation in the Senate. Let me just put a highlighter on that last statement because it bears repeating for any casual listeners, 60 votes to transition from discussion to a vote and then 51 votes to actually pass the thing. If it doesn't get those initial votes, it's floating around in legislative purgatory. For those of you paying attention, those are the two numbers I told you to remember from that Mitch McConnell nuclear option video clip earlier. This means that if you can get 41 senators to oppose a bill, you can just not vote to bring it to vote and it will be stuck in debate forever. So how did Mitch McConnell beat a Democratic filibuster on his Supreme Court nominee? We need to restore the norms and traditions of the Senate and get past this unprecedented partisan filibuster. Therefore, I raise a point of order that the vote on cloture under the precedent set on November 21st, 2013 is a majority vote on all nominations. Now those of you who didn't just break your laptops out of anger are probably asking, uh, what did any of that mean? Well, it means that the Senate's phasing out the filibuster and it's working, although not in the way Democrats were hoping. In 2013, senators approved, along partisan lines, a measure that would ban the use of a filibuster to prevent nominees from being confirmed. McConnell pointed to that rule and said, a Supreme Court justice is a presidential nominee, so yeah, you can't filibuster him. Well, it was a little more complicated than that. A Supreme Court nominee was not on the filibuster proof list approved in 2013, but that was the basic idea. Democrats had a filibuster coalition of 41 to fight his nomination, but because no filibusters were allowed, they lost because the actual voting threshold only requires a 51 senator simple majority. The other less high profile bills that are not subject to filibusters are budget reconciliation bills, trade promotion authority, war powers resolution activities, national emergency activities, and I can see that one getting abused in the near future, and the Congressional Review Act, which allows Congress to review and repeal executive branch administrative regulations. So now that I've spent a ton of time discussing what the filibuster is, why are we talking about it today? Well, several presidential candidates want to further strip down the filibuster rules. Would you urge the Senate Democratic leader to get rid of the filibuster? I think we have to have that on the table. To get rid of the filibuster. Get rid of the filibuster. Now, not everybody's completely gung-ho on the idea. Cory Booker is strongly opposed to tampering with the filibuster. Kamala Harris says she's conflicted on the subject and constantly changes the subject when it comes up. And Bernie Sanders, well, he's a bit confusing. He used the filibuster a lot when Democrats were the minority in the Senate, then spoke out strongly against it when Republicans used it to block legislation, and was most recently quoted as saying he's not crazy about getting rid of the filibuster. Basically, don't be mad at me internet, he's got a lot of pinballed positions on this issue. Interestingly enough, the argument against the filibuster is also pretty nonpartisan. The basic idea was best articulated by Bernie Sanders during his anti-filibuster phase in 2013. What ends up happening is if you manage to cobble together some agreement which does 
gets you 60 votes. What you can be absolutely assured of is that that piece of legislation is going to be much, much more conservative, much less effective than it otherwise would have been. Could we get 51 votes to create millions of jobs and rebuild the infrastructure? Yeah, I think we can. Can we get 51 votes to ask the wealthy and large corporations to help us with deficit reduction rather than cut Social Security and Medicare? I think we can. But can we get 60 votes for those proposals? No, we can't. I hear some of you saying he was talking nonpartisan and then immediately went to quoting Bernie Sanders. Okay. While Bernie is concerned about not being able to get more radical policy proposals implemented because of the need for 10 extra votes, Donald Trump is experiencing the same problem. The president tweeted this morning about changing the Senate rules to 51 votes to get health care and tax cuts approved fast and easy. The frustration that he's had with the pace of some of the legislation, some of the obstructionist tactics that Democrats have employed, whether it's his, his, uh, his cabinet nominees or other pieces of legislation has been well, well documented. This really strikes at the core of the filibuster problem in this country. With the filibuster in place, you can prevent the majority party from doing a lot of terrible things. But without the filibuster in place, your party can't accomplish all of the great things that they promised to get done without being blocked by the minority party. The Senate is the only one capable of changing Senate rules, so Elizabeth Warren, if you really want to change this, Senate re-election? Now it is a true risk to reverse this rule, but if Democrats want to achieve the radical reform goals they've laid out without major compromises, they're probably going to need the smallest vote thresholds in both houses of Congress. Also, Congress will just be able to pass more legislation, good or bad, because the 60 vote threshold in the Senate will be removed. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring, and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching!